where uh, in 2002, uh, the, as you know, uh, there was a patent on BT cotton, and uh, many companies were not allowed to do it. And we have seen uh, even the public sector institutions were unable to move forward on the research uh, and releasing their own varieties with the cotton. Then we realized we need to think of a system where uh, the open source uh, kind of system should come in. And that's the time when, uh, the, for the first time, we came across the work of uh, Jack Kleppenberg from US, uh, some ideas which he tried out. And uh, in India, we tried to modify that into our own conditions and then try to work on production, breeding, to marketing of the seeds. So from community seed banks, our journey was to seed enterprises. So this is about uh, experience of uh, uh, Center for Sustainable Agriculture and also with other groups where we are trying to establish a platform uh, for open source seeds. We call it as Apna Beach. Apna Beach in uh, Hindi, Hindi is the widely spoken language in India. Apna Beach means our seed. Often we, uh, we hear that intellectual property rights protects innovation. But actually, who, whose innovation it is protecting, and uh, who are being protected, and uh, from whom they are protecting, and what it actually is happens. If you look at across the world where IPRs are uh, introduced, particularly in crops, in agriculture, and the current scenario briefly about Indian situation, uh, post 60s, I would say, after the Green Revolution came into India, uh, large expansion of uh, agriculture happened only in few crops. Just five crops today occupy uh, about 55% of Indian kind of, uh, crop area. Five crops. And any paddy, cotton, soya, maize uh, occupy all the area. And uh, within the crops also if you see, major area is under very few varieties. So within the crop also the diversity started coming down. Say for example rice if you take, India is one of the home of uh, rice diversity. We remember uh, reports and uh, records of government of India which says uh, more than 50,000 varieties were under cultivation. Under cultivation uh, around 1930s, 1940s and uh, more than 2 lakh varieties, 2 lakh is 200,000 varieties. Uh, were recorded of rice varieties. But today, 85% of the rice production in India comes from just 10 varieties. And those 10 varieties has more or less same genetic background. And cotton, if you see, uh, India is one of the countries uh, which first knew about cotton. Even Indus Valley civilization had records of uh, having cotton production and uh, clothes uh, weaving. But today, uh, entire cotton production in the country is in the hands of just one company and it seeds. So we are moving into more and more uh, monoculture of uh, crops and varieties. So that's one major uh, issue which we are all uh, worried about. And if you look at the across the evolution of uh, agriculture, it evolved because of the innovation of farmers. And today you are putting in restrictions on the innovations of the farmers. And it is the innovations of farmers being restricted and expecting that only institutional innovations can bring in change in agriculture, I think it's something wrong. It cannot happen because agriculture happens in wide diverse situations and diverse situations requires diverse variety of innovations. And those diverse variety of innovations cannot come from few institutions. So it should be a combination of institutions plus community. How will we bring in that kind of combination of institutions and innovations to work together to create that diversity of innovations is something which is very, very critical. It's not only about seeds, but all about other practices in agriculture. So that's something which is very, very critical. Also, uh, the IP not only the intellectual property rights are not only bringing in restriction, but also it is adding the cost. It is adding to the cost. For example, in India, the cotton seed prices were about 450 rupees per packet of 450 grams, for, uh, which is suitable for growing in one acre in 2002. In 2002, when the BT cotton was introduced, a packet price shot up to 1200 rupees as an IP cost, so it became 1800 rupees. 
one packet of sweets from 450 rupees, it became 1800 rupees. And in that, 1200 rupees was just the payment towards royalty. 1200 rupees on every packet was the royalty. So that's a jump which uh, suddenly I think added to the cotton. So any company which is producing cotton seed in India today, the BT cotton seeds, has to pay uh, the company. And it was a long fight uh, in India to reduce and put in restrictions on the IPs. And this year, 2016, so almost 12 years, uh, 14 years, 2002 when the BT cotton started in India, 2016, uh, Government of India has put in a restriction on the amount of royalty a company can collect. For the first time, uh, there was a law which came up uh, on cotton. We are now trying to uh, extend it to other uh, things. Other major issue, major, major uh, uh, problem which we are facing with the IP is a small companies which cannot innovate are lost in the battle. Uh, either they have to pay huge royalties, and once they make, pay huge royalties, they don't make money. So you are out of uh, business. And you don't have your source, you cannot invest so much on innovations. So how we can bring in a system of collective innovation, a, uh, a community innovation, where number of small enterprises coming together, communities coming together, and uh, using their knowledge to generate new ideas, new pro products, particularly in seeds, is something which is very, very important. These are the things which prompted us to look into the whole thing. And it's very important. These are the photographs of farmers standing in queue for cotton seeds. Uh, what we are all told is, say, uh, you get a good quality seed from companies if, you, if the company is coming. But these are all farmers who are standing in queue. This is for soya. But for this, all other photographs are the farmers who are standing in queue for the cotton seeds. Uh, cotton seed, they stand in queue. There are trampling, which is uh, stampers which happen. Uh, the, the police will be firing, and the queue will not last. Imagine this queue. This queue will not last uh, in a day. So they have to stand for the next day also. So overnight they keep their uh, passbooks, their identity cards in the queue. And then they come back to claim that uh, we are in the queue. So that's the kind of serious situation which we got into. Uh, so you can imagine uh, farmers in June uh, every year uh, before sowing, everybody standing in queue to collect the seeds and then uh, paying that kind of high price and then taking the seeds. And if there is a loss, in the, if there is any problem with the seeds, there is no accountability for the company. So that's the kind of situation which we got. Again, on the other side, this is the seed producers. The place which I come from, Hyderabad, uh, is in Telangana state. The Telangana state produces about 60% of the total seed for the country. So all seed companies are actually focused in that area, that land is more suitable for seed production. So we have a large number of seed farmers who are producing it. And the seed farmers are also not very happy. So this is a maize seed farmers who grow maize for uh, Syngenta. This is a cotton farmers who grow for uh, one of the major seed companies in India. So neither the cotton farmers nor the maize farmers who produce seed for the company are happy. So what we are seeing is the farmers who produce seeds are also not happy. The farmers who are buying seeds are also not happy. It's basically the company in between which is actually making the whole big money. And uh, none of the companies produce seeds on their own. So what we try to do is to create a system where the seed producing farmers can directly sell to the farmers who are consumers as well. So that's a one uh, approach which we try to take. Also from the government, uh, also from the government, the investments into public sector are also uh, coming down. And India used to have large network of seed corporations, national seed corporation, state seed corporations, which used to produce and supply seeds to the farmers. So they all became defunct now. So even for crops like paddy, uh, where you can reuse the seed very easily, even for crops like grounded, where you can really use the crop, the seeds very easily. Uh, farmers are depending on the companies. So that's the situation into which farmers are pushed into. So uh, uh, there are three types of controls which are, we see uh, with seeds as. What is the technological control? 
So the moment you move into hybrids, since you cannot reuse the seeds, unless you have access to the uh, parental lines, you cannot, you cannot multiply. So the, uh, the seed industry is interested only in the crops where there are hybrids. They are not present in the crops where there are no hybrids. So that's something which is very, very clearly seen. So all those crops area which is increasing is only in those crops where uh, uh, hybrids are present. And rest of all the crops, for example, millets, they are just disappearing. Pulses, the area under pulses is disappearing. Oil seeds, the area is disappearing. So where open pollinated crops, <coughs> open pollinated varieties are there, open pollinated crops are there, research focus has slowly gone down. So there are new technologies, other than hybridization also coming in, terminated technology, you all might have heard, uh, genetic use restriction technology called GERP where uh, certain expressions of genes can be regulated from outside. So we are moving into that era where technologically you can control seeds. Second is about the legal control. Intellectual property right is one of the ways, but there are other ways as well, license agreements. So in India, we do honor IPRs on seeds. Legally, India doesn't honor IPRs on seeds. But what they do is there's a license agreement between Monsanto and the local seed company to produce seeds. And uh, IPRs are given on the genes and microorganisms only, not on the seeds. But since the, there is a patent on uh, BT gene, and the gene is present inside the seed, uh, automatically the patent extends to the seed. But by law, patent on seed is prohibited. Patent on seed is prohibited but only patent on genes is permitted, but still genes can uh, be present only in the plant. So obviously, the, the protection extends. Plant breeders rights, uh, tree, uh, all those, uh, the various ways of actually putting in the legal basis. Third, I think, is the major important thing which we all experiencing across the world is about the market control. For example, in India, Cotton farmers have a choice of buying from any seed company, but all of them are licensed from only one company. <laughs> so you may buy from this company or that company, but ultimately you have to pay royalty to one company. And your choice is very limited. And that limitation is extending. And today you know uh, around 10 companies control all the seed market in the world. And uh, the biggest uh, uh, player is the Monsanto. And now with Bayer and Monsanto coming together, I think the threat is going to be much more, much more serious. Uh, because, uh, you know, Bayer has a lot of uh, patents on many technologies in seed production. So Monsanto and Bayer coming together uh, is going to be one of the major serious threat to the country. And all this uh, is leading to increasing costs and monopoly, leading to monoculture of crops as well. Therefore, how do we look at creating a system which increases the biodiversity, how do we ensure free and fair access for farmers for quality seeds? Also prevent others from gaining ideas. This is one question we always hear. Uh, a preventive patenting is what people say. Uh, if I don't patent, somebody else will patent. That kind of thing. How do we create that system where uh, we can get out of this fear and then this concern? Is something which we also need to look at. And uh, for implementing this, what kind of institutional systems we require? Because a coordinated action by a group of communities is what is required. If you want to have a coordinated action by a group of communities, we need to have a formal system where there is a certain agreement between the people which honor, both groups are honor. I think that's something which we need to look at. So how do we create that institutional system is the key. So it's not, it's not so much to do with the technology. It's more to do with the institutional system we create and the relations between the institutions which we create. I think that's something which is very, very key. Again, it's not only about the material. See, seed, uh, when we talk about seed, seed is not just a material. There's a lot of knowledge which comes with it. How do you grow, where do you grow, or uh, what do you do with that? It is the produce which you come from that. How do you protect that knowledge and also share that knowledge is also very important, very, very critical. Uh, and how do we regulate seed market? So to do all these, how do we establish an open source seed system to, which allows physical and legal access to the seeds uh, on a condition that there is no exclusive rights taken by anyone, not only that day, 
but in future as well. So how do we create that system is the key thing which we prompted us to look into and coming up with an open source. That's a big background of uh, uh, where we started off. So open source seed system for us means an arrangement that facilitate and preserve freedom of access and use of plant genetic material which also protects and prohibit exclusive rights and apply to any subsequent derivatives from those materials. So uh, it's also for today and also in future if you are using it for developing new varieties, how do we extend this uh, open source thing is something which is an uh, important thing. So what we tried out, what we tried is to create the, a network, the network is called Apna Beach Open Source uh, Seeds Network. Uh, which coordinates all these activities of uh, uh, from production, selection, conservation, or I'll show you what are the activities. So it's a coordinating agency, uh, it's a network, it's called an open sourcing network, uh, Apna Beach. So individual farmers who are conserving the seeds, or uh, the number of farmer breeders who also make selections, or the institutions which are into seed production can contribute to the seed pool. And it should be documented and made available to others who want to access. There is a two kinds of access for the people who what we created. Uh, I'll share the details of that. One is the farmers who want to cultivate. So they can take it and then cultivate as they want. Uh, other is the further breeding. So I want to use this material to develop further uh, seed uh, new varieties. So in that one of the conditionality we have put in is you have to acknowledge the source of material which you have used. Second is you also have to keep the new variety which you have developed also under open source category. So these are the two conditions which we have put in for that. And uh, all these uh, along with the seed material we are also documenting the entire knowledge base. So if I am selling a seed variety uh, I know from which variety this was selected, what are the selection process, how it can be used kind of thing, so that the next person who wants to sell it can have access to all this information. So that entire information is also available to the people. So what is the value for cultivation of a particular variety in various agro ecological situations is one set of data which we generate. Second set of data is what is the value for use. So when somebody is using it, what for they use it? So if there are tomatoes, whether they are used for uh, home purpose, for making curry or uh, used to make sauce or ketchup, because for both you need different varieties, different characters. Similarly, if you look at cotton to make uh, uh, short staple cottons are good for making certain cloths, uh, long staple cottons are good for making certain clothes. Similarly, absorbent cottons are good in certain situations and non-absorbent cottons are good in certain situations. So we actually document what is the use of a particular variety? And all the database also is made public. Uh, currently, we are publishing it in the form of a book. Now, we are also developing an uh, online database of that. So, the key principles are two. One, freedom of access. Anybody who wants to use the seeds, they should have an access. Either to use, either for cultivation or for further breeding. So, there is a freedom of access. And that freedom of access is governed through a material and knowledge transfer agreements. Material and knowledge transfer agreements. Second is equitable benefit share. In a value chain, in a supply chain of seeds, there are people who are into conservation, there are people who are into breeding, there are people who are into seed multiplication and selling, and there are users. So how benefits can be shared by all? not by exploiting. So that's the equitable benefit sharing principle which we are following. So we feel it increases uh, access to plant germplasm. It prevents uh, biopiracy by establishing prior art because each variety, its physical de description, its value for cultivation, its value for use is documented and made public. So this is, this is the way you can actually prevent uh, biopiracy. And also since it's going to be by a large group, one group coordinating that, the network which coordinates that can follow easily. So if there are thousand groups working across the country who are documenting, but following up with the information with thousand groups becomes very difficult. 
So it is going to be at one place. It becomes much easier. One group, uh, one network which is working with many groups, uh, which has all this documentation, we can establish prior art. Establishing prior art is the key to uh, get over the biopiracy cube where people can get uh, uh, patents. Similarly, since there is a, a viral clause which says uh, if you are using this material, you also have to keep your material also open source, it prevents uh, the big companies to use this material uh, to develop their varieties because they don't want to keep it their own material open source. In India, we also have put a clause that it should not be used for developing genetically modified organisms. Uh, so that's one of the clauses which we also have put in. And uh, developing a legal and institutional framework, it recognizes farmers collectives uh, sovereignty over the seeds. Say, uh, if I'm collecting seeds, uh, the current IPR system honors only individual rights. Only individual rights, even for the traditional varieties which they bring in, uh, one farmer is identified as a person who uh, conserved it and the right is given to him. So in this system we are saying even the farmers collectives, a region can have that right and then keep it open sourced. And it allows farmers to freely exchange, sale, improve and sell seeds. And uh, in the farmers co uh, cooperate with other breeders, scientists, institutions in the development of new varieties and for marketing, uh, see that is not patented or use restricted kind of thing. So the whole network looks like this. See there are more four major functions in the uh, supply chain of seeds. One is about conservation, conservation of the traditional varieties and in areas where there are traditional varieties but which are not uh, in a useful form, we, uh, which are deteriorated over a period of time because they are not maintained properly. We are trying to revive them. We try to revive them. How do we revive them? And then characterize them. So what is the characterization? We need to do the physical characterization, how it looks, what are the physical characters. We also need to look at its uh, characterization of value for use and cultivation. So that's the characterization one uh, is trying to do. So currently we are working with the farmers who are doing this. We are also discussing with the government institutions who are into similar kind of work. Public, there are public institutions also in the similar kind of work. There are gene banks, there are public research institutions which are into this kind of work. So we are also discussing with them. Not much success here, but with the farmers we are able to do it. India also has large number of farmer breeders, uh, farmers who make selections from the uh, large pool of diversity and then uh, uh, make them available for other farmers. So we are working with large number of farmer breeders. I'll show you some of their experiences. Also, in the participatory plant breeding, where institutions are working, like Center for Sustainable Agriculture, at Center for Sustainable Agriculture, we also breed uh, some of the varieties. We work on cotton, we work on maize, we work on various other varieties. So there, we also involve farmers in the selection processes. So it's a participatory selection which we are trying to look at. Participatory plant breeding, we are trying to look at. And Another major important thing what we realized is the maintenance breeding which is very very important. Public sector institution might have released a variety but it's no more available because it is not maintained for the characters. Unless you maintain it, so that maintenance part is about regularly uh, making selections from the same variety, maintaining it in isolation, so that part. Maintenance breeding is one of the very very critical part to maintain any variety. So that's something which is very very important, particularly uh, given the, the climate change which is happening. So unless we make regular selections of the same variety uh, in the current situations, uh, it may not be of much use. Say some variety which was released 20 years back may not be suitable for current conditions. But if we can make selections from that, it will be useful. So that's something which was very, very critical. And in this we are also collaborating with the public institutions. Couple of varieties, we could get them tested from the government to get a certificate about uh, their characters. Third, another very important uh, area of work is the suitability of that seeds for that particular situations. So we we call it as a uh, value for cultivation and use data, and this is done through participatory varietal selection. So farmers grow five, six varieties to, of a crop together and then see which is performing better in their situations. So the network actually looks at coordinating between all the four uh, different functions of the 
uh, seed production value chain. It looks into the registration, licensing, monitoring, coordination, and the legal issues which may emerge from this open source thing. The moment they want to get into commercial production, if somebody wants to get into commercial production of seeds and selling, we had two restrictions imposed on them. One, it says, whatever you sell on that 1% of your net profit, 1% of the total net profit, you need to contribute to the network. So the network can further continue with the documentation work and then helping the seed conservation. Because in the seed conservation, there is no money. So people invest on their own, their interest and all. So give back 1% to the, uh, the network is what is the restriction. Second is, this is very important thing, you need to use the seeds with the same name which the, the breeder has selected. So many times what happens is I take from this and then say this is mine. So what we are saying is if you are taking this, whatever name is written here, you have to use the same name. You, unless you are making uh, changes, so unless you are yourself innovating, it should have the same name. So you have to carry the same name and you have to acknowledge that it is taken from some from the source. So the source acknowledgement and the same varietal name uh, is important. But the brand name can change. Say I may produce as uh, one particular brand by the either as a cooperative or a company and somebody else can produce with a different brand name. But the seed's name, they should acknowledge the same so that everybody understands this variety is from particular source and it has particular characters. So that's something which is an important thing. The third way of using this is for selection or making new seeds. When they are breeding for the new varieties, what we say is you need to acknowledge the source of breeding material. Also, freedom of uh, derivative use, which means, say I bred a new variety, but I also should say the people who are using this also should have freedom to again use it. So derivative use is also free. And derivatives also should be declared as an open source. So you cannot get a license uh, exclusive patent on this because the moment you declare the breeding material, the, uh, the source of breeding material, you need to put in all the terms and conditions imposed by the source. When you are making an application, it actually, uh, you need to put in all the restrictions imposed by the uh, source material. So the moment they do that, it clearly says it should be open source. So, we are now discussing with the government of India that this should be part of the verification system for granting plant breeders rights. So if the material had uh, an open source clause, you need to put in, in the, the new uh, right also, when you are uh, giving a right to the, 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 any, on the new variety, you need to put a condition saying it should be open source. So these are the conditions which we have used and genetic modification not allowed is the other condition which uh, as a group which we used. And only the two agreements, these two agreements are the ones which are actually physically signed. There is an agreement copy which is signed only for these two things. If it is for a commercial seed production or when it is for a new varieties. Whereas this one is not a, uh, a written agreement which is signed. This is basically called as a seed wrap. Like when you buy a software, there is a small sentence which is written on that by uh, opening this packet, you are agreeing for the terms and conditions. That's enough which is accepted. It's called the wrap license. So these are the wrap licenses. So seeds for farmers are under wrap licenses. So the moment you open the seeds, uh, you have freedom to use it. Uh, so what we are trying to do is, so what it says is, the seed is licensed by Afna Beach and by opening this packet, you have the freedom to use the seeds any number of times in your field or exchange with other farmers for commercial production. So you can use or you can exchange. Other uses, what are the other uses? Other uses for selling or for breeding. These two are restricted by other material transfer agreements which you need to sign and that are available on the internet. And in return you pledge that you will not restrict others use of these seeds or their derivatives by patents, licenses and other means and include the pledge with every transfer of these seeds. So even if I am giving to other farmers, you include that giving to them as free. But the moment I am getting into 
breeding or commercial production, I will sign an agreement. So that's the arrangements which we have. So when we started this, we started about 2009, first time when we started this. And uh, now, if we look at, we have about 100 varieties in 20 crops, and some are from public domain, which are the varieties which are released by public sector, but no more use. So we revive them and then we may characterize them and then we are using them. And we also have 50 varieties which are from the cereals, pulses, vegetables, from the traditional varieties. And uh, we have farmer breeders who develop, so we have two cotton hybrids. In cotton and maize we are also working on hybrids because there is a good potential in terms of, uh, because of their uh, high heterosis and uh, being open, uh, cross pollinated, uh, the, the yield variation between uh, the <coughs> variety and hybrid uh, in good conditions is significant. So we are also working on, uh, cot in cotton and maize we are working on hybrids, but all other crops it's open pollinated varieties which we are working on. And uh, there are several others which are in the process of testing. We also took some varieties from Sativa. Sativa is a seed company which is based in uh, Switzerland. And we, have, we are now getting into a collaboration where we are uh, able to produce some of their vegetable seeds. So these are the existing material. And we also have lots of uh, farmers cooperators which are into this. We have a seed conservators network in India. We have a biodynamic farmers network. Uh, we have a society for agroecology which is a group of agriculture scientists across the world. We have a society called society for agroecology. Uh, we are using uh, that as a platform for actually anchoring the program. We have holiday people science network, A and B community. So this is a network which we have. So typically this is the catalog which we are doing. This is in Telugu. Uh, India has uh, diverse languages, so we produce catalogs in local languages. So for every, say this is Aboriginal, Brinjal. So it has characters, physical characters and value for use characters and it will also say where they are available, the source. And uh, this is a pink variety, this is a white variety, it's the same. This is uh, chilies, this is a bitter cow, this is another variety of chili, this is jova. So in the value for cultivation what we do? We have plant characters, crop details and grain and pod characters. That's, a, that's what we calculate apart from the value for use and uh, cultivation. These are some of the varieties which we have. He's a farmer breeder. He's uh, based in one of the very remote villages in uh, northern India. He's partially blind. 90% of vision of his vision is affected. But still, still he's one of the best breeder I have seen. Some of the best varieties in India are selected by him. He can't see. He, he can see only at this distance. In less than uh, less than a half a meter is what he can see, but still he can make a very good selection. Some of the best vegetables, some of the best rice varieties, this rice variety, this is rice which you can see here, this is a red gram, the pigeon pea, this is a beech. There are some very good varieties which he has evolved. Now he is uh, directly marketing, uh, yeah, the last one. So he is directly marketing them. Then there are a number of vegetable varieties. This is a cotton, this is a maize, this is a B. So like that we have several varieties which we are trying to use. So at the village level we have community seed banks for saving, sharing and using the seeds. At the same time we also have community seed enterprises uh, which are coming up. And uh, these are uh, some of the seeds which we are producing and we have the seed uh, uh, processing units. We have two big seed processing units with the uh, farmers cooperatives and the two small ones. These are the small mobile ones. This size is a small mobile one which can be transported to any place uh, where farmers can easily process. Uh, this is a big one. So we have two of this and two of this. So four seed processing units uh, with the farmers cooperatives which we have and produce and then sell. So we produce small packets, we have big packets. 
much bigger packets as well. So depending on the requirement. And uh, one more thing which we felt uh, last time uh, from the last seven, six, five, six years of working with agrobiodiversity community, unless we create value for the diversity, again, it's not much of use. Uh, the many of the products, many of the crops and many of the varieties are going out of use because there is no value created for them. So one of the things we are trying to create is uh, special <coughs> varieties, so red rice, uh, which is not very popular, creating the, uh, documenting the medicinal values, create, documenting the special uses for that and similarly documenting uh, and bringing several varieties of vegetable which were otherwise not uh, cultivated. So this is one variety of uh, vegetable which is called spine gow. This belongs to the same family as bitter gow, uh, but very small in size, this will be of this size round and uh, not very popularly cultivated. But now we could revive some of the varieties and then bring back them into cultivation like that. Similarly getting into processed foods, because current processed foods are all based on one or two varieties of crops. Say, entire bread is made from wheat. We completely make it uh, billets. So, entire bakery items are all made from that. So, we try to we work on that and then come up with new products uh, from these varieties. Uh, you can see some of the products which we made uh, on the table. We have the seeds packets as well as the products which we made on the table. We have solar dried uh, fruit products. So, we work on jackfruit, we work on pineapple, we work on mango, papaya, and several other products. Uh, to solar dry and then bring out products. We are also working on uh, millet cookies, to make cookies out of millets, little millet, finger millet, lot of the millets which are either otherwise neglected, we are making of them. We are making porridges, soups out of them. And similarly, we are working on colored cottons to revive and then come up with uh, the entire cotton value chain as well, from seed to cloth in the same village. So these are some of the products which we are trying out. Uh, the jackfruit, one of the most neglected crop, but today we have very delicious products made out of it. The jam is one of the most popular products which we have. Uh, we also make uh, chips out of uh, jackfruit and some other products. Similarly, all these are millet cookies, uh, mixed fruit jam with many of these products. We have pickles, we have spashes, we have solar dry products. So, using creating value addition locally and then creating value for the diversity is something which is the very, very critical thing. So we have, uh, this is the last slide. So we have the farmers cooperatives, 30 cooperatives which are federated into what we call as Sahaja Ahara. In Sahaja Ahara in Hindi means natural food. So which produces and sells food and seeds. So that's the whole background of our work. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Divine from Uganda, regulator. Mm -hmm. I, as you can hear, I'm a regulator, and my concern is maybe he has already talked about the government. You have explained it, but is it clear, is it true that the government doesn't at all come in to regulate what you are doing? Nothing at all. So that, how do you control the quality if they are not there? I need to know that. Yeah, if the government is completely out of this of the picture, so you are doing working without the government, or uh, you can explain to me that. And secondly, I saw you are talking. You are going to uh, because what you are showing were, were like uh, self uh, open open OPVs, open varieties, or self self pollinating. Yes. But then I saw you are going in for hybrid maize. Now, if you are saying the farmer is free to exchange or reuse, how are you going to, re uh, in that case, how are you going to reuse the hybrid? How are you going to do that? Because it's not reusable. Or even cotton hybrid. I don't know how you're going to go about it. OK, those two questions. Uh, see, uh, in India, the the seed marketing is uh, governed by government. So anybody who wants to sell seeds in the market is governed by government. So all our seed cooperatives also have a license from the government to sell seeds. So we have to abide by the seed laws. So that's where government comes in. Second, 
uh, in terms of quality check, seed uh, certification is not mandatory in India. Seed certification can be from a government agency or it could be a self certification. Could be self certification, but the norms are defined. So, what is the quality parameters which one should adhere to? Quality germination, uniformity, uh, all these physical characters, all these are defined. So, those we need to abide by that. So, see the cooperatives which uh, which are in the commercial market are all having the license from the government uh, to produce and sell the seeds. And the source of the seeds we need to declare. And the source of the seeds they declare from the open source seed network. So the open source seed network has all the documentation, and then that will give the uh, letter. So that's the model which we are trying to work on. So government is there. It's not that government is not there. But government, uh, the question which uh, he raised is about whether the government is encouraging open source model. So we are now that's something which we are trying to negotiate with the government to bring in more. Uh, to have open source clauses into the seed uh, legislation. So you are saying the government is there and there is certificate. And do you have inspectors who come to, to inspect? No, that's what I am saying. It is, it is not mandatory. No. So if you can see, like participatory guarantee systems in organic. See, there are two ways of certification, like in the organic also. Organic also has two certifications. One is a uh, third party certification where uh, some outside person comes and verifies whether you are doing organic or not. Right? The second one is called as a participatory guarantee system where a group comes together and then declares that it is, open, uh, it is organic. Likewise, in seeds also in India we have what we call as a truthful label. Truthful label, truthful label which means uh, I adhere to the, my declaration. So I declare that this seed is 95% uh, pure and it has uniform and it has the germination is 98 percent is what i declare and i have to adhere to that and if anything is found to be violating that one i am uh, i can be punishable so anybody selling in the market can go for can opt for truthful labeling or can opt for a seed certification both choices are there so many of the seed companies sell by truthful label they don't go by certification so both choices are there in india so the national laws vary from country to country. That's something we need to look into. Yeah. I, I have there are questions. Can I go? Say this is the last one. Okay. And then I'm going to the next question. So we can have a discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Ramu, for the insightful pre presentation. I'm actually following up what Divine asked because I think in your presentation you said that um, we are now encouraging grand seed farmers so who produce us to sell to produce or sell directly to the farmers. I'm saying in your presentation in some way you say you mentioned that uh, the ranch scale farmers who are, yes, who are seed farmers and producers to sell directly to the farmers. So in that respect then how do you ensure that the quality and the standard is guaranteed? Because you may find some um, farmers or business people are willing to take advantage of small scale farmers if there is no inspectors. See, that's why we are trying to do it through the seed cooperatives, farmers cooperatives, where the cooperative has the control over the production system. So there's a verification system which is part of the cooperative. So cooperatives verify, they cross check, they document, and then, then only it will come into the market. So the moment it is coming to the market, there is a verification system. So we have a verification system across the corporate. 